Well, I have, um, I have some really good news this morning. I mean, besides the fact that, uh, that Jesus is on the throne and he's uh, uh, just, you know, in this election season, let me remind you that Jesus um, is on the throne and he wasn't elected and he can't be kicked out. He can't be replaced. And um, if, uh, if you're connected to him, if he rules and reigns in your life, you're going to be okay. All right? I just wanted to throw that out there. But the other good news this morning is, and I know you're going to be really excited about this, the bathroom partitions have been ordered. So uh, it won't be long, and um, there, there will be partitions, and uh, you won't have the friendship toilets. Um, and, uh, um, we love, that's right, it's all about community. We're, we're big into community. Oh, no, the early church was not like that. Um, we are um, in a series, and um, I'm going to continue with that and, uh, this morning, and the series is about wagon wheels. Um, actually, we're talking about the, the culture, the culture of Westlake, and what we're, what we're intentional about, what we're going to be intentional about, creating a, a culture here that um, um, we're not perfect, right? right amen. You're here, so we're not perfect. <laughs> We're not perfect, and uh, you know I say all the time if 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 you, you know if you went per, if you want perfection um, you came to the wrong house, and um, if you want a perfect pastor uh, you came to the wrong place. Um, uh, you put me on the that pedestal. What am I what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm going to jump off or fall off. Um, but we're talking about the culture of our church and. And so, you know, at the beginning of this series, I said, I, I see it like a wheel um, with, with equal spokes, and those spokes have to be equally balanced, um, or, or things get out of balance. When you focus on one thing, you do one thing well, well, that's great, but, but the early church did several things very well, and the power of God moved in and among them, and that's what we're looking for. We believe that the, that the God that they served is the same God that we serve. The God that they serve, the, the, the God that they served that showed up in power and might is the same God that we serve today. And I see a lot of believers wringing their hands and worried and they're watching Fox News and they're freaked out. <laughs> Quit watching it. Right. You know, I mean, you need to know. No, listen, you need to know what's going on. But, but I, I, I would rather hear from heaven and know what God's doing. Yeah. What, what is God doing in all of this? What, what, is, what, is, what is he doing? What, what does he want me to know? What, is, what does he want me to hear from heaven? Amen? Amen. And so we're talking, about, um, we're talking about the culture that we're going to be intentional about creating here. And, and so we talked about prayer and that being a focus of what we do here. Um, we have prayer at uh, a Sunday nights right now at 6, uh, six o'clock. And um, uh, come, join us. It's just a time of, of encountering God and, and petitioning heaven. Um, we talked about um, a culture of unity, that the early church was, was of one mind and one accord constantly throughout the book of Acts. I don't think it's a coincidence that's, that it's mentioned over and over and over in the book of Acts that God took that diverse group of people, just like us. We're so diverse. Look around you. There are people different than you. They think different. They come from different backgrounds. And, and God takes that diverse group in, in the early church and he takes the diverse group today and he wants us to be one. He wants us to be united around one cause. Even though we don't have, even, may, even though there may be a lot of things we don't have in common, at least we have him in common, right? And so we talked about unity. We talked about honor. This, that this would be a place of honor, that we would create a, a culture where we honored one another, the different gifts that different people bring to the table, no one more important than the other. I was thinking when I got here this morning, I was sure glad to hear drums. But I was equally glad to hear a bass guitar. 
You know what I'm saying? I was equally glad to, to, glad to hear uh, Kaylee lead a worship song this morning. I mean, every different part. I, I'm, I'm glad that we got someone with the, with the little ones today. I, I'm so glad that we have someone to greet us when we walk in the door. Amen? That, that, and, 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 and they're ready and they're smiling and they act like they enjoy life. Right? A culture of honor where we honor each and every one of us and no one's more important than the other. Uh, a culture of giving. A culture of generosity where we give of ourselves and we give of our stuff for the body of Christ, for one another. When we see that someone's in need and we give of ourselves to meet those needs. A lot of times we're praying for God to, to help or meet needs and God's saying, okay, you're it, tag, go for it. <laughs> um, we talked about uh, having a, um, accountability, a culture of accountability where things don't get weird Anybody been there yeah. where things just get out of, just get weird. And so that we have a culture of accountability where we can say, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not so sure God's in that. I'm not, right? Where we're subjected or, or submitted to one another in accountable relationships. We talked about last week about the culture of grace. I hope we have enough spokes. We're running out of spokes. No, but have a culture of, of grace where, you know what? We get second, third, fourth, fifth chances. And that people don't, we don't give up on one another. Right. Don't you give up on me. Yeah. Right? Don't give up on me. I'm not going to give up on you. Yeah. Right? So we, we, get, we get more than one chance. It's a, it's a culture of grace. God gives us grace. Amen? Amen. Um, and then um, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, a culture of, of worship. A culture of worship. And, um, and so we're going to look at what, what worship is and what worship is not. Uh, uh, worship, real quick, worship is not um, um, the songs that we sing just before um, uh, I get up and preach. That's part of worship, but worship so much bigger than that. We're going to talk about it today. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that it is alive. It's not just a history book that we read about stories and, and, um, and people from, from years past. But God, it's a, it's a living book that was inspired by you where we can open up the pages and we can find you. That we can find you revealed in those pages and in those words. God, that you could speak to us and we would, we would grow to know you. God, in that, that word would change our lives. God, I pray that this morning that that word would change our lives. God, there's no reason for us to come. There's no reason for us to gather if you're not here with us changing our lives. God, we don't want a social gathering where we just hang out. God, we want a, we want a gathering where you're right smack dab in the middle of it and that you're Lord over it all and that you move among your people and you do what only you can do. Yes. Change your hearts. Yes. As we open up and we receive your word today, change us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Worship's not a show or, or a performance. A lot of times we look at this and, and, and uh, you know, in our culture, our culture today, we, 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 have, a, we have what looks like a stage a stage is for performance. This is a, let's not call this a stage. We're not like the world. Don't be conformed to the world. This is a platform. A platform is a place of influence. It's not a place for a show. Worship's not a show. It's not, <laughs> it's not, a, it's not entertainment. We have in our, we have in our culture a, 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 a culture of people that want to be entertained. We can't, I don't, I started to say we can't. We are foolish to try to com compete with Hollywood. They got nothing. They got nothing that God's people need. They have nothing that his people need. We don't need, we're not here to put on a, a song and a dance. We're not here to entertain and impress. We're here to encounter God. Yes. Worship, worship's not a song. It's not music. Those are just tools. Worship is, is so much bigger than that. 
Worship's not observing God. It's not sitting there and watching the show. It, it's, not, it's not simply learning about God. Worship, worship's about encountering the creator of the universe. It's about having a God encounter where I know that I know that I know that I met with him. That's what worship is. Worship sets the stage where I can encounter God. It's so much bigger than song. I, I remember when, when, I was in, when I was growing up, we had a song service. Anybody been there? We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today, right? And, and, and it was a song service. We didn't even call it worship. And it was kind of just the prelude to the, to the message. The message was what people came for, and we just sing songs. And, 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 and then there was a transition, I think in the, kind of in the 80s at least, in, at, where I went to church, and there was a transition. And I remember how the people fought against the, the pastor taking the hymns out of the church. He la- literally took them out and like put them somewhere where I don't know if he I don't know if he sold them gave them away they were nowhere to be found and he took you're not gonna believe this he took an overhead projector and he projected courses on the wall and you would have thought you would have thought that Jesus had left the building the way the people acted. It was like, I mean, we changed, we were transitioning, we were transitioning from a a way of doing worship and the people fought against it. I'm not, listen, there's nothing wrong with hymns. Man, hymns, there's some hymns that are powerful. There's some hymns that are unscriptural. But there's some worship songs today that are unscriptural. You you know what I'm talking about. You hear them and you're like, that's not even in the Bible. What do you, I mean, what in the world was that guy drinking when he wrote that one, you know? I mean, what spirit was he of, you know? And, and, um, and so, you, you, you know it's true. Um, and so we, musicians are different. They're just different, right? And no offense if you're a musician. But, but we, 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 we have, I, in, in the church, there was this transition and, and something shifted. And I, and I think God was behind that. But in the middle of all that, the enemy can come in and he can disrupt it and he can mess it up. And he can make it something it was never meant to be. It's not, we're not competing with the world. I love these lights. But you know what? We, God can show up without these lights. Believe it or not, I, I know it's hard to believe this, that God can show up if Patrick's not here to play the drums. I know that's hard. It's hard for me. I, you know, it's been a long time since we've like had a, a electric guitar regularly. And, 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 and I used to think that God couldn't show up and worship if there wasn't an electric guitar, but he can. They're just tools. They're just tools. I was reading a story, in, in, and I think it was in 1 Kings, where Elisha, uh, the king came to Elisha, and he needed to hear, he wanted Elisha to hear from God. He wanted a word from uh, Elisha. He wanted wisdom. And in and, and this story, Elisha, Elisha goes, well, go get a musician. And then a musician comes, and boom, the word of the Lord comes to Elisha. And I thought, wow, Elisha even leaned on the tool of a musician and the anointing that could flow through that. They're just tools. But God can use them to do powerful things and to set an atmosphere where he can show up and move among us. Worship is any activity, I'm just going to read this, any activity, individual or corporate, that causes us to encounter the presence of God. That's Pastor Robert Morris from Gateway, that's, that's how he defines it. Any activity, individual or corporate, that causes us to encounter the presence of God. I, 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 I'd like to add to that because I think there's more to it than that. I, uh, I think worship is our response to the revealed reality of God. It's us responding to what we see and what we know about him and how it's being revealed to us. It's us responding to us seeing something about God we've never seen before and we respond. It's like when we were, and maybe this is not your experience, but I remember when I was seven years old and, and I remember I, I, I can still picture the room. I cannot tell you anything about the speaker or anything else, but I remember when there was an altar call at seven years old and I was, I was to the right of, of the speaker. And I remember, I remember me going down to meet Jesus. 
I remember me responding to a a revelation that God is real and he loves me. And my response was coming down and kneeling to him and making him Lord of my life. That was an act of worship. It was about me realizing that he is who he says he is. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And he came to save me at seven years old. And that, my, my worship was just a response to what I saw and what, what, what was going on inside of me. It wasn't something external. It was something that God was showing me inside and revealing something to me. Go to Revelation chapter 4. You can mark a few verses here. I, I, um, we're going to start in Revelation 4, but you can, you can mark in your Bibles 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Matthew chapter 16. John chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 2, Matthew 16, John 4. And we're going to be- begin in Revelation 4. Verse 6, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle, the four living creatures each having six wings Listen to this. We're full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I, I can't help but think that these eyes that are all around and within, eyes that are, seem to be external, you see that external around and within, eyes that are inside, I, I can't help but think that those eyes have different perspectives. They're different places. And how, how many know you can, you, how many know we can all see an event and we can all see that event differently play out based on our perspective, right? <laughs> and, 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 and I can't help but think that these four living creatures that are around the throne of God that have all these eyes, all and they're seeing different perspectives of God because they're around his throne. And, and I, can't, I can't help but think that they're, they're constantly wowed by the holiness of God. Because for all eternity, they've been hanging out. And they've, they've never ceased to say, holy, holy, holy God, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then I, I think the other one on the other side sees something with one of his eyes that he's never seen before. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is to, is to come. And then another one sees something else about God. Holy, holy, holy. Why? Because God is so, so incredible. And we just get bits and pieces. The more we, how many, how many know him better today than you did 25 years ago? You, 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 know, you know things about him, and, and you, had, you, had, you had a perspective of God years and years and years ago, but as you've walked with him, that, thing is, that perspective has changed a little bit. You have a different, you, you know him better because you've been around him, and he's revealed himself to you. I, I see these, these beings as, as being constantly, constantly, Wowed by the revelation of God as they see him. And I think worship is us responding to how we see him. I think there are those that know him as healer because he's healed you. And your response, I, I, we went and saw the movie Risen. How many seen that movie at the theater? I, I, you, know, I, you know, if you want to take my Siskel and Ebert um, Review. I, I wouldn't bother going. Um, I was kind of disappointed. Uh, there was a guy healed of leprosy. Horrible leprosy. And Jesus goes and hugs him and he heals him. And, and his response is, he walks away. And he turns and you see he's healed and he walks away. And I thought, that's your response to being healed? Are you kidding me? And I don't, I don't know about you, but I think I would be dancing a little bit. I think I'd be like, are you kidding me? Whoa! 
I think my response would be like, like be, I, I think I'd be hugging Jesus. I think I'd be falling down at his feet. I think I'd be saying, thank you. <laughs> thank you. God has shown up. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being loud this morning. And it's going to keep you awake. <laughs> Nothing like snoring saints. Uh, go to John chapter 4. God reveals himself to us and our, our worship is, how, is our response. And some of us are more animated than others. You know, I think uh, uh, years ago somebody told me you can't, you cannot, you, know, you can't guilt people into doing, into worshiping the way you think they should worship. You, it doesn't work like that. Is your heart responding to the goodness of God in your life? And you may not be loud like me, and that's okay. You know, you, you, you may be a really good dancer, not at all like me. And you can, you know, you can bust a move. And in the presence of God, that could be your response to him. Some of you can sing. Some of you, not so much. So, some, of you, some of you can make a joyful noise, and that's about it. Some of you can shout unto God and some of you can just be really quiet and reverent and reverent before him. It's what is, what's in your heart responding to what he's done in your life. That's worship. John 4, verse 19, Jesus has met this woman at the well and she gets a little, uh, something that's been bothering her probably her whole life. Anybody ever wonder why there's so many churches that worship different ways and why, they, why some baptize by dunking people and some just sprinkle? Anybody ever wonder? You know, anybody ever wonder why, why you go to some, I've been to a church where they had like, um, a liturgical church where they had like a pulpit over there and a pulpit over here. And I thought, well, are they going to have dueling, dueling um, preaching? Or I... I how many know what I'm talking about? There's diff different ways that people worship, and, and you, got, you got a church that doesn't allow instruments, but you, they, can, they can sing really good. And I'm wondering if this woman, this woman has this, she has this question, who's right? Anybody ever wonder, who's right? Well, we are, of course. <laughs> John chapter 4 says this, verse 19, she, she has a question. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers, then she goes, then she goes right here to her question that she's been, she's going to ask God when she gets to heaven. But since he's a prophet, she's going to ask him. Everybody, anybody have a question you're going to ask God when you get there? Anybody? You got to, you think, and then and somebody says, well, that question will be irrelevant when you get there, but you still want to ask it. You, right now, you're, you want that question answered. And, and, and so she has this question and she wants it answered and nobody can answer this for her. And so she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where, you, where one ought to worship. Who's right? Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the father. And then he says a bold statement. You worship what you do not know. You have no clue what you're doing when you go to worship. You're just going through some ritualistic exercise. You have no idea. You have no revelation. You're just, you're just going through the motions. And I wonder how many in the body of Christ show up and they just go through the motions. They have no revelation of why they're doing what they're doing. They're clapping their hands because everybody else is clapping their hands. Woo! That's a good beat. They're raising their, they might raise their hand. There's the, you're right, you have the sold out raising, you know. But you never start like that. I don't think anybody starts like that. You start like this. And then as you really, you know, you get really into it, then you, you kind of go a little bit like this, you know, right? You know, it's true, you know, and then, and then, and then one day you just, you go for it, you just go for it with the one hand, just the one hand. You just got the one hand worshipers and you know, that's true. <laughs> you know, it's true. You're laughing because you've all done it. 
And then that day when you get real holy, you, you go up with both and you're sold out, right, to Jesus. You walk into a, a worship setting and, and people are doing that and you're thinking, what in the world? You, you know, what are they doing? There are people, some of you have been raised in it, you've been in it a long time, but you don't remember the first time. I remember when we changed, when we shifted from, from uh, I serve a risen Savior. He's in, <laughs> uh, I, I remember switching from that to this different form of worship and I just didn't get it. I didn't get it. And then we started going to another church and they, were, they, 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 they had the overhead. And they sing these choruses over and over and over. And I'm thinking, God, I'm, I'm pretty sure God got it. <laughs> anyway, anybody been in those services where you're like, really? We gotta, you think God's hard of hearing? He's got to hear it again? Right? And I, I just remember... I struggle with clapping my hands just because everybody was clapping. And I went through a transition in my life, a, 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 really a, a season of searching. Why, why do I do that? Why, why are they doing that? Why, why are some of them on their front, in the front uh, looking like they're passed out, like face down? Why, why are they doing that? Why are some of the people raising their hands and, and some people kneeled and, and, and why are some people crying and why are they doing all that? And I would just stand there and I would just look at people. Anybody like the people watch? And, I, and you go to church, that's a great place to people watch, by the way, church. But I used to just watch people and I would think they, maybe they know something I don't know. I mean, it's good music. And back then in the 80s, there was a lot of like the, you know, la, 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 the Hebrew sound of music and the charismatic movement, you know, and, and those minor songs, which I never really got into. But, but I, I, I just, I just, I just, I went on a journey and I began to open up the word of God. And I, I, I found out that all of those were forms of worship. That it was okay to clap your hands because the Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. And, 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 and the word worship and, and, and the Bible and praise, it, 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 there's several different meanings behind every, each and every one of those words. And when you look it up in the Greek, they're all different postures. One of, them, one of them is to raise your hands. One of them is to shout. One of them is to make a loud noise. One of them is to dance. And I, and I began to see, wow, it's, it's all scriptural. It's all a response to God being revealed in your life. And, and, and it's not about just joining in with the crowd and, and, and this external ritual. Amen. It's about worship that comes from here. And my response is unique because he made me unique. And no one can worship him like I can. It's, it's like your child that, that writes and, 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 or colors, uh, uh, you know, a coloring or, or draws something and you put, it, you put it on the refrigerator and there's no one, no one that walks by can tell what it is. But it's precious to you because your kid drew it for you. It's the same with our worship. We touch the heart of God when we respond from our heart. That's what worship is. It's God has done something in my life and, and externally, I've got to express that some way. So today it might be on my knees. Tomorrow it might be on my face. The next day it might be hands lifted up. The next day it might be shouting. I might be loud. I might be quiet. I might grab my guitar and play it. I might sing him a song. I might sing him a new song. I might sing him an old song but it's gonna come from my heart as I worship him because that's what worship looks like. Jesus tells this woman, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know why you're worshiping. You don't know what you're worshiping. You have no clue. It's just an experience for you. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is there's a shift just like back in that day, back in the day, there was, there, when there was a shift in the church, Jesus is saying there's a shift. There's something changing. And now it's happening right now. This worship that you've, you've been walking, it's shifting right now. And this is what Jesus says. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers 
When true worshipers, you're, in other words, he's saying to you, you're not a true worshiper. You don't even know what you're worshiping. But the hour's coming, and today it's starting, it's shifting, it's already shifting, that true worshipers will worship the Father, not in a place. It's not about the place. It's not about the location. It's not this hill or that hill. It's not about the location. It's about worshiping the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking. Look, God is seeking for worshipers. He's seeking for true worshipers. He's seeking for those that aren't here from the song and the dance. They're not here for the show or the performance. He's looking for true worshipers who will worship him for real. That will worship him from their heart. That it's not a ritual. It's not, I, I got to get all dressed up and go to the church house because I got to go put on a show. It's not about worship in this house. It's about worship in this house. And I take this everywhere I go. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's about worship in this house. Not this house. Can you imagine if we learn how to worship in this house? And then all through the week and then corporately we come together. What will happen in this house? What will happen here? I'm thinking God will show up in power. I'm thinking when God's vessels come out and corporately pour themselves out, what will God do? I'm thinking God will touch lives. Will transform people. Worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Go to Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to talk about what's worshiping him in spirit and truth looks like. What, what is that? What does that mean? Worshiping him in spirit and in truth. First Corinthians. No, I'm sorry. Where, where did I say go? Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 13. Jesus is with the disciples. And... Um, um, he's, he's going to have a, um, he's going to have a chat with them. And they sat down and, and Jesus came, verse 13, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am, that I, the son of man am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it blew Jesus away. Because Peter got the answer right. I think Jesus was probably like, uh, that is a miracle. Peter, I know flesh and blood did not reveal. I know you ain't that smart. I know you did not get that on your own. That is a miracle. The father, the father spoke that and you heard him. Jesus, Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven, my father who is in heaven revealed this to you. You heard from heaven. Heaven came to earth and you heard it and you, you, you spoke what God revealed to you. You spoke what God revealed to you. Worshiping him in spirit and in truth is is my response to God revealing truth to me. The truth about who he is. It's like that day when I was seven years old and it was revealed to me that he was my savior. I responded. I responded. There have been times when God has revealed to you maybe that he's your provider. There's... There's, you didn't know how you were going to make ends meet. You couldn't figure it out. And, and, and at the end of the month, you made it. You, you made it. And you didn't know how you were going to make it. You didn't know how you were going to put food on, food on the table. You had no clue. You, you, you had no idea how you were going to pay all the bills, how the electricity was going to stay on, or how you weren't going to get evicted and kicked out. But, but you made it. You made it to the end. Some of you, you've been raising your kids and you you thought, man, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how they're going to be so messed up. They're going to be so messed up. But you made it. You made it. 
I mean, they haven't yet, but you made it. <laughs> but you discovered that God's a God of grace and mercy, that he's, his grace and his mercy is bigger than your inadequacies. And you respond, you respond to that how? By worshiping a God that is, that is God of second chances. God, I thank you. How many needed a second chance before? Yeah. Or third or fourth, fifth or sixth? Yeah. And God has revealed himself as that God, that God that gives grace to the humble. And you respond accordingly. That's what worship is. I'm really yelling a lot. I'm not mad. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to what it says in verse 20. I think this is interesting. You would think that um, in today, well, let's, 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 let's move it up today to our culture today. Let's think about preachers today. If I was special, if I was special and, um, and I was amazing, um, I would be okay with you telling other people. Come on, I'm just being real. Jesus is the son of the living God, the Messiah they've been waiting for. And Peter recognizes that's who he is. And at the end of the conversation, Jesus says this. He says, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, can you imagine the disciples? Whoa, 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 wait, wait a second. Wait a second. We can't tell them who you are? I mean, how are we going to build a movement? How are we going to get this revol rev revolution? Uh, how are we going to get it bigger? We can't go tell people. We, we know that you're the Christ, the son of the living God, and we can't go tell people. You know why? It's the same. Re Listen, it's the same, same thing for us today. You can't convince anybody that he is who he says he is. Go ahead and debate them on Facebook. It does not work. It doesn't work. Debate them face to face. It doesn't work. It is only when God opens up their eyes to the reality of who he is that they can finally see. You can, you can, you can argue all you want. It's not through intellect. It's through his spirit that he is revealed to the world. It is through our spirit that we reckon. When Jesus came and he read from Isaiah, he read from the book of Isaiah, and he, and he, and he closed it, and he said, today this is fulfilled um, um, in your sight. Listen, 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 listen. The Bible says that every one of them, every one of them, every one that heard him bore witness to the truth of what he just said. But in their head, they couldn't get, they couldn't get it past their brain that he was Joseph's little boy. And as a result, they sought out to kill him. But inside, there was an opening of the eyes to the reality, and they shut, they shut, them, they shut that themselves. God revealed that to them, and they shut that themselves. Do you, you see that? And so you, you, can, you can debate all you want is when God opens up their eyes and they have to receive what God has shown them and worship is them responding to what God has shown them, not you convincing them otherwise. Worship, worship is never true worship if it's secondhand revelation. It doesn't work like that. Salvation is not salvation if it's secondhand revelation. It is salvation happens when, when you know that you know that you know that God has shown himself real to you and you respond accordingly. It's not some prayer someone convinced you to pray so that you would, listen, I, I, I've been door to door. I've been door to door getting people saved. And there have been times, I guarantee you, those people prayed that prayer to get me off their front, get, get me uh, away from their front door so they could, they could be left alone. Anybody been there? True, true, true worship is God revealing himself to us and us responding to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We all have to understand who God is the same way Peter did. And it's through God's spirit speaking to us. 
and revealing to us. It's God opening up our eyes so that we can see. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I hear a lot of people quote this scripture, and they only, they only quote part of this scripture. I, I has not seen. You know, the Bible says, I has not seen. It's so It sounds so religious. I has not, the Bible says, I has not seen nor, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love. And we don't know. We'll just never know. We'll just never know. You just never know. Because God, no, no eye has seen or ear heard. There was a shift. Something changed, by the way. That, that's, what it was, that's, what, that's what was said. But we've got to read on to find that there was a shift. There was a change. Listen to what it says. But, everybody say but. but. That, means, that means what I just said is changed. Because that just, that's, just, that's just English grammar. That's just the way that works. But something's changed, and here's what's changed. Change. God has revealed them to us through his spirit. God wants to show us things. Listen, listen. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. No one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. No one knows the deep things of God except the spirit of God. The spirit of God reveals them to us so that we know them and so that we respond when, when, when it's revealed to us. That's worship. Has God been good to you? So he's revealed his goodness to you. So your worship is, should be in response to the goodness of God. We say that all the time. God is good all the time. Is that a ritualistic saying or is it true? Does God show his goodness to you all the time? Does he show it to you all the time or are you just saying that? Oh, uh, getting deep. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. We, we've received the spirit of God, the spirit of God that searches the deep things of God, the things that know, the, the, the spirit that knows God lives on the inside of you. The spirit that knows him, the spirit that is him lives on the inside of you. If you're a believer, the spirit of the living God that knows him lives on the inside of you. Worshiping him in spirit and in truth is, is him revealing himself in spirit. Revealing who? The truth in spirit. So I, 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 I get revealed to me that he is my provider. That's truth. How did, I, how did I find that out? Because someone convinced me through a debate? No, because his spirit revealed it to me. And now I respond in my worship is in spirit and truth. Do you see that? There's a lot of, okay, okay let, me, let, me, let me say this. How many have read the Bible and there are things you don't understand? And then you've read again and boom, you understood it. And you've read it a hundred times and then you saw something and you're like, oh my goodness, I finally understand that scripture. I finally got it. I, and, and somebody didn't teach it to you. You just got it. There are things that sometimes I preach and people get things that I don't even say. Well, Pastor Wood, you said, and I'm like, I don't think I said that. I, I didn't say that. What, well, what, what was happening? God was revealing something to them based on us reading scripture, not me saying something. Do you, are you getting this? And so we, 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 get deep, we, we dig in it. How, how in the world do, does this come alive? It's the spirit of God in us that brings that thing alive to us. And then we see things that we've never seen. It's like those, 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 those creatures around the throne of God that have those eyes on the inside. We, see, we have, that, we have that eye on the inside. It's the spirit of God. How many has how many's ever, ever had trouble in math? And then you got it. The light went off, and you, I got it. It's the same principle. God's the revealer. I got one more verse, and we're done. Genesis chapter 28. So we're basically, we've gone to Revelation, now we're going to Genesis. The whole, we're covering the whole Bible today. Genesis 28, and I'm done. We want to create a culture of worship. A culture, a culture where God is revealed and we respond accordingly. 
We want to give room for, for God to be encountered. If you came just to hear me preach, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're going to be grossly disappointed some days. But if you came to encounter God, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Amen. I don't know what the pastor preached on, but God showed up. What an awesome testimony. Genesis chapter 28, Jacob is um, asleep. He's gone to sleep and, and he's, he's got him a rock there and he puts his head on a rock and he goes to sleep. And he has a dream, a vision he, when he's asleep. And, and there's this, this is the encounter. Some of you may recall this story, but there's a ladder going up to heaven. There's angels ascending and descending. And, 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 and it's, it's a gateway to heaven. So it's like heaven coming to earth in this place where he's at. Now, I wonder how many's ever felt like you're in a God forsaken place. Anybody ever been there? Some of you thinking, I kind of feel like, you know, our country is kind of getting there. But a place where you think, man, this is like Ichabod. God is left. This. And Jacob's in a place and he, he doesn't sense anything supernatural going on. But he goes to sleep and God shows him what's going on right there, right in that place. He, he sees with a set of eyes that he's not looking with. And this is what he sees. Or he sees, the, he sees the ladder and the angels going up and down. And then this is what he says. Verse 16, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord, listen to what he says. Does it, say, it doesn't say was in this place. It's present tense. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Surely he didn't say the Lord showed up last night. He said, surely the Lord's in this place and I didn't even know it. I didn't even recognize that his presence was here. And he said, I was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Heaven is touching earth in this place is what he's saying. And I didn't recognize it. I just laid my head down tonight and God showed me, I'm here. I'm in this place. Open up those eyes, those spiritual eyes, and you'll see me. I'm here. When you wake up, I'm still here. I didn't, I'm not going anywhere. The Lord is in this place. This is what he does. He takes the stone, he sets it up, and he says, this is the house of God. He calls it Bethel. The place I met God. He calls this place the house of God. Why? Because God's presence is here in this house. Heaven is touching earth right here. I saw it. It's not just goosebumps. God's in the place. Or, or the air conditioner could be turned up too, too high. Right? It's not about feeling something external. It's knowing that something is. It's a reality that God's in the place. Some of you, you've been in places where somebody's tried to convince you that God's in the place and you're like, God is not in this place. And you know, you're, you're like, okay, let's worship God in spirit and truth. Well, there's no truth to that statement whatsoever. There's a bunch of strife and confusion in every work of the enemy. Anybody been in those places? And so, so, so here, here's the point I want to make. Where's the house of God today? Where does heaven come to earth today? It's right here. It's right here. Heaven's coming to earth. Well, I, I, don't, I don't feel like it. I don't, it doesn't matter. I worship him in spirit and truth, not based on what I feel. Feelings lie sometimes. I worship him in spirit and in truth. He is here. He is with me. He is in me. I am the house of God. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells on the inside of me. He's never going to leave me nor forsake me. God is not on some distant planet somewhere. He is right here. Anybody ever pray and you feel like your prayers are hitting the ceiling? It doesn't matter because he's with you. It, it, that's all. It doesn't, have to even, it doesn't have to even go above your head because he's with you. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to read this one verse and then we're done. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we just, we just read it. 
Jacob was saying, this is a house of God, a place of worship, a place to encounter God. And God's saying, every single one of you are a house of God, a place to worship, a place to encounter God. What happens when we come together collectively, we all bring our houses to this house and we collectively worship him. Oh, I cannot imagine what God will do in our midst. Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Not just the things, the giver of the things. God wants us to see him. Let's bow our heads. God wants us to see him. God wants us to recognize his presence in our life. And he wants us to respond. That's what worship is. How do we respond to the goodness of God? God's spirit dwells here in us. We're individually his house. We come together collectively worshiping him in spirit and in truth. I don't know, maybe this morning one of you were worshiping the healer because he showed up and revealed himself as the healer this morning to you. So you are worshiping him as healer. Some of you, some of you in this place, you, you saw him as provider and your worship this morning was in response to a God who provides. Some of you saw him as a God of grace and mercy in your time of desperate need and you responded you responded to that revelation that God is a God of grace and mercy. Somebody in this place may have worshiped the peacemaker in this place, the, 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 the prince of peace, the, the, the one that gives peace that passes understanding because you saw him revealed to you as peace because you were stressed out when you walked into this place, but the peace of God has come and you responded this morning. I don't know what your response is. I don't know what kind of response that wells up on the inside of you, but I would say this, that we need to be very careful that we don't judge someone else's response because we don't know, we don't know where they've been and we don't know who God has revealed himself to them to be. Some of you were worshiping a refuge this morning because it feels like the whole world is against you. But this morning, God showed you that he is your refuge, your strong tower. It's what worship's about. It's about me coming. Me focusing on the God, the creator of the universe, the king, my king that sits on the throne. If God be for me, who can be against me? Whew. That demands a response of worship from me. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come this morning. As they come, they're here to meet with you and to agree with you. If you need prayer this morning, they're here to pray with you. Don't hesitate. Just step out. If you have a need this morning, whatever it is, step out. If it's a financial need, a physical need, a need in a relationship, whatever. If you're oppressed, whatever you're dealing with this morning, just step out and they're going to be here to pray with you. God, I thank you that your word is alive and, and God, um, you're constantly revealing yourself to us. God, you're constantly revealing yourself to us. God, help us never to get stale or stagnant in our response to you. God, I pray just like those four creatures around your throne, that we would be constantly wowed by you. And God, we would not remain silent, but God, we would, we would offer up our worship to you in response to, in response to you revealing yourself to us. God, you are indeed good to us. 
There is none like you. You are the one to be worshipped. You're it. God, we, we worship so many other things. We, we give our adoration. We give our heart to so many other things. But God, you are it. You're the only one worthy of our worship. God, I pray that not only in this house that we create a, a place of worship, a culture of worship, where people will encounter you. God, I pray that people will walk in that back door because we've been faithful to cultivate a, 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 a culture of worship in this place, that they would meet you for the first time. God, that, they would be, that you would be revealed to them like never before in this place. That they, they would have a God encounter that would transform their life forever. God, I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied with the lost remaining lost. God, I hear the cries. I hear the cries of our community around us. God, those that have no hope, God, I pray that in this place that they would find a God of hope. God, send us to them. God, as we, as we create an atmosphere in this place of worship, God, I pray that we walk out of this place and in, in, in our own house, this temple that you've created in us, that we would carry the power and the presence of God with us wherever we go. God, and that we would be, we would be carriers of your peace and your hope to a generation that needs it desperately. God, that we would carry, we would carry the good news, the good news in a culture where there is none. God, that you would send us to the sick, the dying, the hurting. God, you would send us to the marriages that are crumbling. And because we're a house of worship, God, those around us encounter you. God, I pray that those that are bound, they would be set free. Because we would speak, a, we would, we would speak a, a word in due season. God, we indeed worship you. Because you're the God, the creator of all. And I'll not sit by and allow creation <laughs> something something as lifeless as a rock I'll not set by and allow it to outdo me I'll withhold no worship to the one to whom worship is due I'll withhold no praise to the one who deserves it all God you're my rock my fortress my ever my ever-present help in time of need. You're my savior. You're my king. You're my healer. You're my provider. You're the friend that sticks closer than a brother. You're the peace that passes all understanding. <laughs> God, that demands a response of worship. Let us never be shy about responding to who you show yourself to be.